Okay, oh, well, welcome everybody to another farm video that's facts about ruminant methane. I'm excited to have our speaker, Dr. William Weingarten, just for this presentation, and I'm going to ask our Chief Executive Owen Jennings to introduce him. Well, thank you, Robin, and uh, hi to everybody. We're very privileged to have uh, Dr. William Van Garten here with us uh, from Toronto in Canada. Uh, William's got degrees in uh, physics and in uh, computer science uh, and has a, a international reputation uh, in the area of climate issues, uh, particularly associated with physics. So it's a real privilege to have him. He's a, a leading international climate scientist and brings a really interesting and really up to the minute perspective uh, to the whole issue of methane. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak today. I am looking forward to some point in my career of visiting New Zealand rather than just seeing you virtually. I've heard it's a very pretty place to visit. I'll be speaking today about some work I did with Will Happer of Princeton. This has been a very fruitful collaboration. Well, let's see. Okay, there we go. First thing we'd like to do is look at the concentration of methane versus time. The way we get these very old records of methane concentration is we look at so-called ice core data. If you drill a section of ice as shown in that left figure, say in Antarctica or Greenland, what you get is a series of rings. So this is analogous to counting tree rings. There are air bubbles trapped in each of these rings, which correspond to uh, snow deposits every year. And you can then analyze these bubbles for the concentration of methane. So that way you can get methane concentrations going back thousands of years. So at the bottom, we show a plot of the black curve, which is the methane concentration in units of part per billion. Notice in 1880, it's about 800 part per billion. And this has increased over the 20th century to right now about uh, 1.8 part per million or 1800 parts per billion. Now the dashed curve, that's the data taken from the ice core. In the last uh, 50 years, we have measurements taken at Mauna Loa. This is a volcano located in Hawaii. They have instruments that can measure the methane gas concentration directly in the air. And you can see the Mauna Loa measurements agree nicely with the Antarctic ice core. The red curve shows the increase each year of the methane concentration. And you see the methane concentration didn't change very much uh, from 1880 to about 1905. Then something happened, I don't know what, it increased sharply until about 1940, and then the growth rate increased. Uh, this can be explained by an increase in fertilizer, an increase in agriculture, et cetera. Then after 1980, uh, the methane growth rate seems to have gone all over the place. And notice for some years after 2000, the methane growth rate was negative. So that means the methane concentration in the atmosphere was going down. Now, the obvious question is what happened here? And the only explanation that I have received that I'm not entirely very happy with is that communism ended. The Russians had a lot of leaky gas pipelines. And after communism ended, the Western world came in and taught the Russians how to properly have a non-leaky gas pipeline. I'm not so certain I buy it. I wish I could see some scientific study that showed estimates of leaking gas to justify this curve. Similarly, one can go back and say, what happened in 1905? Well, in 1905, we had the first attempt at a Russian revolution, but again, I feel a bit leery about that explanation. So if someone can point to me a scientific study that shows why this uh, methane growth rate suddenly changed in 1905 and why it has gone all crazy uh, since after 1980, I certainly would be loved to uh, look into that. 
Now, what we're going to be talking about today is the infrared radiation or heat that is emitted by the Earth's surface. And we'd like to explore how that heat is transferred through the atmosphere to outer space. Now, it turns out there are a number of these so-called greenhouse gases that can absorb and, of course, emit this heat or infrared radiation. There are five gases that are significant. Water vapor is by far the most important greenhouse gas. Then carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrous oxide, and methane play small roles. Now, in our calculation, it's very important that we understand what is the dependence of temperature on altitude. So if you start out at the Earth's surface, you're at a temperature of about 15 Celsius or 288 Kelvin. As you go up in altitude, the temperature goes down. I think we're all familiar with this. If you climb a mountain, it generally gets colder. The temperature decreases until you get to an altitude of about 11 kilometers. Then we have the region called the tropopause where the temperature is relatively stable. If you go higher in the stratosphere, the temperature starts to increase. The reason for that is we have ozone. Ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun and therefore heats the atmosphere. So this temperature peaks at an altitude of about 45 kilometers where the ozone has its maximum concentration. If you go to higher altitudes, the atmosphere becomes very thin and the temperature decreases as you go out to space. So this temperature variation with altitude is what we take into account in our calculations. Next, it is important for us to understand how the concentration of these greenhouse gases also depends on altitude. For the case of CO2, which is given by this uh, reddish brown curve, uh, the concentration of CO2 is uh, about 400 parts per million at all altitudes. So it doesn't vary much at all. Water vapor goes down very noticeably as you go up a few kilometers. Uh, so notice this decreases by about a factor of a thousand as you go from the Earth's surface to an altitude of 20 kilometers. Ozone given by this dashed or dotted brown curve this increases until an altitude of about 40 kilometers, and then it goes down. And methane and N2O, shown by the dashed black and green curves, are shown. So these, these concentration versus altitude curves, this is what is, comes from observation from these high altitude balloons. So this dependence of concentration on altitude, we also use in our calculations. The next thing we use is a library called Hytran. And what Hytran does is gives you a list of the colors or frequencies of infrared light uh, absorbed and emitted by these various greenhouse gases. So at the top, we see uh, all these blue dots. These, each blue dot represents a different color that can be absorbed by a water molecule. So notice there are a lot of blue dots here. I think there's about 100,000 different uh, frequencies or colors of, of water uh, that the water molecule can absorb. Now this black line, this shows you the colors or frequencies that are emitted by the Earth's surface at a temperature of 15 Celsius. So what is important to realize is this black line coincides with a lot of these blue dots. And that's why H2O water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. Below that, we show the uh, frequencies or colors that are absorbed by carbon dioxide. Clearly, you see where this black curve has a maximum, we have a lot of these red uh, CO2 lines. And that's why uh, CO2 is a very significant greenhouse gas. Ozone, you see a lot of uh, lines. N2O and methane, less so. In the case of methane shown at the bottom, we see that a lot of these methane transitions occur where the 
uh, spectrum of heat from the Earth given by this black curve uh, is not as strong as it is, say, for the case of CO2 or water vapor. Now, whenever you do some calculations, it's good to compare to measurements. How well do you really understand things? So here we have pictured a balloon. This balloon goes to very high altitude on the order of uh, tens of kilometers. And below this balloon, you have a scientific instrument that measures the intensity of these different infrared colors or frequencies. On the left, the gray curve shows the experimental data. So the gray is the observations. So this shows the intensity of light from 500 to 850 wave numbers. Now the black curve is people's crude fit to the observations. And notice there's a big discrepancy in this region from 500 to about 550 wave numbers and also over here from 750 to 850 wave numbers. In fact, when you see such disagreement, you know you don't understand things very well. Now, what we have done is we have modeled the data. First, we modeled the data uh, as people did before with the so-called void line shape, shape. This is just a measure of how each of these lines are shaped, how well they can absorb. And so black here is our analysis when we do the same analysis as these people over here trying to fit the gray data with this black curve. We believe we know how to properly account for the line shape, the spectrum of each line, and we get this nice blue curve. And notice if you look at the correspondence of this blue curve, it looks a lot more like these gray observations. So we believe we have a better understanding for the line shape than the people who just use a void line shape. Now, if you look at the, uh, how heat goes from the Earth's surface up through the atmosphere, what we have to consider are the different colors. So here we first consider a photon, a particle of light at 500 wave numbers. 500 wave numbers is at a frequency that is strongly absorbed by water vapor. So here we plot heat or the flux, uh, the energy per second per square area going up versus altitude. So if you consider a particle of light at 500 wave numbers, it starts out from the Earth's surface, it gets through finally the water layer, and then once it's done, uh, at an altitude of about seven kilometers or so, it's just this smooth sailing to outer space because there is very, very little water vapor above seven kilometers. If, however, you take a photon at 667 wave numbers, this interacts with carbon dioxide. And it interacts with the carbon dioxide so strongly that as that particle of light goes up in altitude, it can be absorbed by the CO2, but then of course the CO2 can emit it going back down. So there's almost no net flux going up until you get to very high altitudes around 86 kilometers when the atmosphere becomes so thin that then finally the photon or the light at this frequency can escape the Earth's atmosphere. If you go on to 971 wave numbers, Turns out there are no greenhouse gases that absorb. So as soon as you lift off from the surface, it's smooth sailing. That particle of light goes right through to outer space. Finally, we consider a photon at 10, 16 wave numbers. This is at a wavelength where ozone absorbs. So you notice that the concentration, that the flux goes up, but then it goes down because of the all the ozone present at an altitude of about 35 to 40 kilometers. And finally, when you go above 45 kilometers, there isn't much ozone, and then it's smooth sailing to outer space. So it's very important that you take into account the frequency dependence of the energy going through the atmosphere. Now let's look at the effect of CO2. So let's look at this top graph. 
So here we plot the flux. This is the uh, amount of energy per square meter per area per second. And we're looking at the, at the end of this flux emitted at the top of the atmosphere. So this is something that a satellite could measure, which I'll be talking about shortly. So the vertical axis, we look at the flux. And here, the horizontal axis, we look at the frequencies or the range of colors of the infrared light. Now, if our atmosphere were completely transparent, had no greenhouse gases, then you get this nice blue curve. This is what's known as a black body curve to uh, any scientists in the audience. The temperature corresponds to the Earth's surface at 15 Celsius or 288 Kelvin. Next, I'd like to focus your attention to this black curve. To get that black curve, we put in water vapor, we put in 400 parts per million CO2, we add in the ozone, the N2O, methane. And notice we get this black curve as shown. In this region from zero to 500 wave numbers, we see a discrepancy between the blue and the black curve. And that's because of the absorption by the water vapor. Then we come to this big dip at 667. That's the strong CO2 absorption. Then we have another dip at about 1,016 wave numbers. That's the absorption due to ozone. And finally, after about 1250 wave numbers, you have this big dip. That's mainly due to water vapor, a little bit due to methane and N2O. Next, let's suppose we have an atmosphere where we've taken out all the CO2. So then we have zero parts per million CO2. Then instead of this black curve, you get the green curve. Now, in this region from zero to 500, the black curve nicely overlaps the green curve, so you see no difference. But from around uh, 600 to 700 wave numbers, you see a big difference here. So here, if you have zero parts per million CO2 or 400 parts, you see this big difference, and that's what all the fuss of global warming is about. Next, we say let's double the, the CO2 to make it 800 parts per million. So right now our atmosphere is about 400, maybe 410 parts per million CO2. Let's see what happens if we double it many hundreds of years into the future. Then instead of the black curve, you get this red curve. Now you have to look closely for the difference between the red and the black. And that difference between the red and the black curve is what all this global warming fuss is about. Now you're probably thinking, William, we asked you to talk about methane, not CO2. Well, let me talk next about methane. So let's look at the bottom curve. Once again, we're plotting the flux of heat going up through the top of the atmosphere versus frequency or color. Our blue curve corresponds to a transparent atmosphere without any greenhouse gases. Our black curve correspond to our standard atmosphere. So we've loaded in the water vapor, the 400 parts per million CO2, the 1.8 part per million uh, methane, the ozone, et cetera. So we have a black curve here that's identical to the black curve in the upper figure. Next, let's take out the methane. So we reduce the methane to zero. Then we have our green curve. And notice you see almost no difference except in this small little region from about 1250 to 1400 wave numbers. In fact, you probably see no difference. That's why I wanted to show the, the CO2 graph. Otherwise, you'd say, William, what are you talking about? We can't see anything. If we double C, uh, the methane, we get this red curve. And once again, you barely see any difference between the red and the black curves. Now, why should you be paying any attention? How do we know, or why do we have confidence that we know what we're doing? Once again, you have to compare your model to observations. And these are observations taken by a satellite. So this satellite had a spectrometer that measured the intensity of the various frequencies. So here on the vertical axis is plotted intensity, 
on the horizontal is our frequency or a range of infrared colors. Now this satellite looked at the Sahara, Mediterranean, and Antarctica. The Sahara is obviously much warmer than the Mediterranean and Antarctica. And if you look at this vertical scale, this runs from zero to 200 intensity units. The Mediterranean is cooler, so it runs from zero to 150. And the Antarctica is much colder, so it produces much less heat. So notice this goes from zero to 60. Now, what we have done is said, how well can we model these observations shown on the right? And our model is shown here in the, to the left. Now, if you look at the Sahara, our model is very close to the observations. The same is true for the Mediterranean. This red curve, this corresponds to the black body corresponding to the surface temperature. For Antarctica, notice this black curve looks very different than the Mediterranean Sahara, but yet it agrees very well with the observations. Some of you might be saying, William, how is it possible that this red curve, which corresponds to the surface temperature, is below the actual heat that's generated by the Antarctic atmosphere? The reason is, if you're standing in the surface at the Antarctic winter, and then you stick your hand a kilometer up, the temperature actually goes up in altitude. This is known as a temperature inversion. So because the temperature goes up in altitude for the first few kilometers in Antarctica, you get more heat produced than you would expect using the surface temperature. So the fact that we can explain this Antarctica observations with our model gives us great confidence that we understand what we're doing. Next, I'd like to discuss something called radiative forcing. So what we do is we plot this heat or measured in watts per square meter. So this is power divided by area as we go up in the atmosphere. This green curve corresponds to our calculation when we consider this standard atmosphere that exists today. 400 parts per million CO2, or standard water vapor, methane, etc. And we see this power goes up and then eventually it remains pretty constant because at these high altitudes, the atmosphere is very thin. Now the question is, what happens to that curve when you double the CO2? Well, then it's harder for the heat to get out. So then we get this red curve. Now, the difference between this red curve and the green curve, this is something they call forcing. This is something you probably hear a lot about the climate people talk about. You can also play the game, say, what happens if you cut the CO2 in half of 200 parts per million, and then you get uh, this flux curve change in the opposite direction as when you uh, double the CO2. So the forcing is just the flux difference at high altitude when you double CO2. Now, the one thing I'd like to talk about is forcing or saturation of it. So what we do here is we look at this flux at the top of the atmosphere, and we plot this again with frequency. Once again, if we have a transparent atmosphere, we get this blue curve, that black body curve that corresponds to a temperature at 15 Celsius, the surface temperature. Then we put in our water vapor, our ozone, methane, N2O, as well as various concentrations of CO2. If we put in no CO2, we get this green curve. It underlines this red curve. And here you see this green, as we showed before. And then it overlaps with this red curve. Now, let's see what happens when we start to increase the CO2. Suppose we put in 50 parts per million. Well, the only region where there seems to be a significant difference is right here. And you have to look closely. Clearly, there's a big difference between zero parts per million and 50 parts per million. 
Again, 50 parts per million, that's only one eighth of the 400 parts per million that exists at present. Suppose we put 100 parts per million. Well, you see a slight change, but not that drastic. 200, 400, 800. What I'm trying to convey is all those curves with higher CO2 concentrations, they don't look that different. That's what we call in physics saturation. Now, what does saturation mean to a layman? Well, suppose you have a barn in the field and you want to impress your neighbor. The barn is gray. You want to paint it red. Well, if you paint one coat or give a second coat, your neighbor is probably going to see a big difference. But if you paint, say, 10 coats or 11 coats, I doubt the neighbor will see any difference between the 10th and the 11th coat. That's an example of saturation. The same thing with CO2. If you increase the CO2, there isn't much change to this curve, and that's what we call CO2 is saturated. Now, uh, this curve uh, tries to illustrate these saturation effects, and uh, so this is meant maybe more for the scientists. I apologize if there are people who are not a scientist. So here we have plotted the power per molecule. So what we do is we consider the flux, which is the uh, energy per second per area going out of the top of the atmosphere. And if we take that forcing and divide by the column density, so this is molecules per square centimeter, then we can get something which has units of power. Now let's first consider this left side of this curve where we label it H2O, water vapor. First, we're going to consider an earth that has no greenhouse gases. We then add one water molecule, measure the flux at the top of the atmosphere, add another water molecule, a third, measure the flux, divide by the column density of water when we have very few water molecules, and then we find the power that can be absorbed by these water molecules. Next, we do the experiment a different way. We start with no atmosphere. We now add all the other gases except water vapor. So we add the CO2, the ozone, the N2O, methane. Then we add one water molecule at a time. And we see we get nearly the same answer as when we had the blue experiment, which didn't have those other gases. So the reason why those two curves overlap very nearly is that the water vapor lines don't interfere over overlap these lines of the other molecules. Next, we do the experiment a third time. Now, before we add in an additional water molecule, we add in our standard atmosphere. So our methane, our N2O, ozone, CO2, plus our standard water vapor concentration. Now we add in one more water vapor molecule at a time and look at how the flux changes. And now we get this red power. And notice this has gone down by a factor of more than a thousand. And the reason for that is the water vapor is very strongly saturated. Now we can do this experiment uh, with CO2. And what you find is CO2 also is strongly saturated by more than a factor of a thousand. So water vapor and CO2 have very big saturation effects. If you look at ozone, N2O, and methane, you also have strong saturation effects by a factor of 10, but that's less than the factor of 1,000 that you had for CO2 and H2O. Now let's get to temperature, which I think everyone probably is concerned about most. Now, again, we're looking at clear sky, so we do not consider the effects of clouds. And so what we want to do is estimate the surf change in surface temperature 
due to doubling carbon dioxide. So doubling means going from the present about 400 parts per million to 800 parts per million. First thing we do is we say, if we double the CO2, let's assume that the water vapor does not change. And this is known as fixed absolute humidity. Now this problem was first considered by Manabe and coworkers. This is the Manabe who got the Nobel prize a few weeks ago. And he estimated the change in surface temperature is about a bit more than one degree Celsius. We've checked Manabe's calculations and we get the same answer. Uh, you probably are saying, why do you bother to check a fellow scientist's work? Well, Manabe did his work in the 1960s. He didn't have the benefit of fancy computers, et cetera. So he had to make some approximations. So we're not trying to downgrade his work. We just want to make certain we understand it. Other people, including our most recent work, everyone agrees you double CO2, water vapor stays constant, you get slightly more than a one degree C surface temperature change. Now, if that were all to climate change, no one would be making a big deal. But there's something more. Manabe was the first to point out if we have a small temperature change of one degree centigrade due to more CO2, that will mean that more water vapor could conceivably evaporate and go into the atmosphere. So he said, let's assume that we have constant relative humidity. So that means the temperature goes up, you need more water vapor to keep the relative humidity constant. Now, of course, the first question you can have is, has that been substantiated by observations? The answer is no. It is far from clear that the absolute humidity is increasing so that the relative humidity remains constant. If you assume this fixed relative humidity Manabe found a surface warming of about 2.9 Celsius. When we check Manabe's calculations, we get about 2.2, as do several others. Now, this is a very crude temperature estimate. And we should emphasize all of these temperature estimates by us and by the IPCC have huge uncertainties. What are they? First of all, I mentioned that the fixed relative humidity assumption is not borne out by observations. It's very unclear that we see water vapor increasing in the atmosphere. Secondly, you have to worry about clouds. All of these calculations were the effect of clear sky. Clouds are very complicated. They can have cooling and warming effects. You also worry about convection or the weather changing changing weather patterns, ocean currents. And you also have to worry about melting ice. If you don't have a nice white ice surface, but you have black soil, you of course are going to get a bit more heating. However, given that very little of the Earth's surface is covered by ice, this is probably going to be a small effect when you average over the entire globe. Now let's look at the methane contribution to global warming. First of all, if you look at the methane con uh, concentration in 2019, it was 1.8 part per million. That's a very solid measurement. People are not going to disagree with that. CO2 was about 410 parts per million. Again, a very solid measurement. Now, if you look at the increase of methane from 2008 to 2019, it's about 7.6 part per billion per year, but that is very uncertain. In fact, if I were to have taken the period 2000 to 2019, I would get a much lower number. But to get a temperature uh, increase due to methane, I want to take the worst case scenario. So I take this interval because then I get a high number. So red here indicates things are uncertain, at least by a factor of two, maybe more. For the same period, the CO2 increase is about 2.3 part per million per year. That's a very reliable number. Now, if you take this ratio, 2.3 part per million 
divide, uh, divide by 7.66 part per billion, or maybe I should have said the other way around, 7.6 part per billion divided by 2,300 part per billion, you see we get a ratio of one over 300. So basically this says, for every molecule of methane I add to the atmosphere, I'm adding 300 molecules of CO2. How long does it take to double methane? Well, if I take 1.8 per, per million, I take this rate of increase, we get an estimate of about 240 per year. Notice since the growth rate is very uncertain, I have put this doubling time in red because that's also highly uncertain. If I use a more realistic lower number, I maybe get 500 years or more. For CO2, 410 parts per million, how long does it take to double? About 180 years. Now our calculations have then shown what is the potency of CO2, of methane relative to CO2. If I add in one methane molecule, it's 30 times more effective at warming than CO2. So this ratio is 30. But since we're adding uh, 300 times more CO2 than methane, the net effect is if I take one over 300 and multiply by 30, you see the effect of methane is one tenth that of the CO2. Now the surface warming, we've projected about 1.5 to two Celsius. Again, this is very uncertain due to uh, a lot of uncertain due to water vapor, clouds, etc. If you divide this by 180 years, you get about 0.01 or a hundredth of a degree Celsius per year increase due to the increasing CO2. What's the effect of methane? Well, it's one tenth that of the CO2, so it's one milli degree, 0.001 Celsius per year. So this is very, very small, and there's no way you're going to be able to measure that. Now let's look at New Zealand's contribution. If you look at global livestock, all the livestock in the world, they're about are responsible to about to one third of the global methane production. Uh, New Zealand livestock is about 71% of uh, New Zealand's total methane production. Now let's see how bad those New Zealand cows and sheep are. So I looked at the percentage of uh, cows and sheep that are blessed to have a New Zealand passport, and I come well to about 1%. In fact, when I, I was struck by these numbers, 10 million cows and 16 million sheep, uh, I thought if each of them could vote, I'm sure you would have a majority animal rights uh, government in New Zealand. So you have a lot of cows and sheep in your country. Now let's look at the methane contribution of these New Zealand livestock to global warm. Well, we take 0.001 Celsius per year. That's the global increase of temperature that is due to methane increasing. Multiply by the 1%, which is due to New Zealand cows and sheep. And of course, one should multiply by other figures, but I wanna get an upper limit we come to about 10 to the minus five Celsius per year or a hundredth of a degree per millennium. So this is a very, very tiny number. So what are our conclusions? First of all, we've examined more than a third of million lines of water vapor, CO2, ozone, N2O, and methane. The important thing to consider is that saturation very strongly suppresses the effect of these greenhouse gases. And that saturation is very strong for uh, all of these greenhouse gases, but especially for water vapor and CO2. The reason why we mention that is people like to think of methane as being this very evil molecule. Well, the reason is that the methane concentration is a lot lower than it is for CO2 and water vapor. CO2 and water vapor are much stronger greenhouse gases. We have excellent agreement with the satellite observations. 
The surface warming due to doubling methane or doubling CO2 is at 1.4 Celsius if you consider the water vapor not changing. If you consider an increase of water vapor such that the relative humidity remains constant, you get an increase of about 2.3 Celsius. Again, the observations do not substantiate that constant relative humidity assumption. The one thing that we really should worry about are clouds, which cover about two thirds or even 70% of the Earth's surface. We are working on that at the moment. Probably the effect of clouds is going to reduce uh, these temperature increases that you calculate for the surface. Methane for the world is about 0.01 Celsius per year for New Zealand, 100 times smaller. So the moral of the story is we should leave Heidi and Susie in peace. Now I was talking to a group in Ireland and I was trying to convey that all these regulations to uh, reduce methane by farmers is not going to affect the climate at all. And these farmers were of course, were very concerned because all these regulations can put them out of business. So I said, well, maybe the argument you should use is you should go to your politicians and you say, uh, rather than tackle us, because that would just be symbolic, maybe you could tackle another uh, group by another symbolic measure. So instead of reducing the amount of sheep and goats and cows, you could tell all the city folks to do away with all their cats and dogs. Not so certain if that has gotten anywhere, but it would have an equally silly effect to these regulations that want to reduce the dairy and sheep herds. Now, finally, I'd like to leave you with a little uh, tidbit of our ongoing work on clouds. It's going well, but I don't want to say too much. Uh, for the scientists among you, uh, the calculations for clouds are more complicated because you have to worry about scattering of radiation. The scattering can also be anisotropic. So the mathematics becomes more complicated, but we're making good progress. Uh, the reason why we think we are on the right track is here we show you some uh, observations of that Nimbus satellite over the Western Pacific. This upper curve is for the clear sky case. And here we have shown our good model. So this seems to agree with the observations. This lower curve is for the case of clouds over the Western Pacific. And our quick calculations show this curve on the bottom right. This seems to match the observations quite well. So we are confident, um, maybe I should conservatively say next year, we'll have an update to our work, which is expands from clear sky to take into account clouds and uh, seeing what the effect on the climate is. Thank you for your attention. I just want to say thank you uh, a thousand times for uh, a good clear explanation of something that you know is relatively complex um, and you know, we just appreciate your time and um, your contribution and we really look forward to next year when you know there's obviously going to be an extension of your you know your thinking and along with the Dr. Happer it's great look forward to it. Thank you very much. Well thank you very much uh, Dr. William Van Weigarden. I mean this was a, a very compelling presentation. Um, it, it shows to me that those who are calling uh, for drastic measures in, in particularly in New Zealand context of reducing methane emissions and having a big impact on our global um, the, the, the production that we, we produce. I haven't really looked at all the factors about the impact of methane and um, we really appreciate your presentation as Owen said it was uh, easy to follow. It's great to, uh, when you read these things you see all the graphs and the lines and it's very good to have the person who wrote it actually explain it to us as 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 we go through so we really do appreciate that um all power to you with the work you're doing it's extremely important work and uh, one thing that the uh, farm will agree with Greta Thunberg on is that we need to listen to the science and we really look forward to your science progressing and shedding more light on this topic so thank you very much thanks again thank you all the best great, bye then